Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure having Mr. Dave Cole here with me, President and CEO of EMX Royalty. Dave, it's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Ronnie. Where are you currently, if I may ask? I'm currently in Colorado. Yeah. So the last time we saw each other, Dave, uh, I think it was the Precious Metal Summit in Beaver Creek. Creek we yeah. primarily talked about skiing. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talked about <laughs> where to go powder skiing best. So, so I think we we both have a um, yeah a, 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 a big we we both enjoy going skiing quite a lot. Uh, you living in Colorado, I'm living uh, uh, in Austria. Actually, we're experience, experiencing our fourth lockdown here in Austria, wow. but getting used to it. Um, Dave, I would like to take the opportunity as you are one of our esteemed premium partners of the in gold we trust report um to talk a little bit about the price of gold uh the commodity market uh in general but then of course especially um yeah have a conversation with you about your company um what what really um, uh, you're, you are most excited about what's going on at EMX and yeah, um, I think that's, that should be very, very interesting discussion that I, uh, greatly look forward to. So Ronnie, there's, uh, there's a lot within that, right. And, and it's really fun to talk about commodity prices and follow these capital markets. Um, the, the fact that governments continue to print more money, politicians love to print more money. Loose monetary policy is uh, looks like it's here to stay for a while. And of course, that bodes well for precious metals. But there's other large picture aspects of the commodity markets that are worthy of paying attention to. And class creep around the globe, you know, and as, as people move from from uh, lower uh, lower class to middle class, the consumption levels increase dramatically, and that's happening throughout the developing world. It has been for some time, and that's been driving commodity consumption. And some of the commodities that we're most interested in are copper, uh, nickel, and uh, zinc. Uh, we think the metals markets are really poised to move ahead. And there's another interesting aspect, and that is supply inelasticity. It takes yeah. a long time to bring on new mines. Uh, much longer than it does to drill a new oil well, for example. The oil industry can respond to increased prices very quickly. It's much more difficult than the mining business. Yeah. And so that creates that supply and elasticity, which can exacerbate price moves. And um, another one that's, that's interesting, also part of the loose monetary policy, is these uh, crazy low interest rates. So, so we're seeing bond prices at the highest that they've ever been in history, thousands of year high. And uh, with negative real interest rates here in the United States approaching four or five percent, and it's rather astonishing. Um, and of course, that 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 uh, you know, your free money is just fueling economic activity and contributing to to supply shortages. Uh, it's an interesting scenario to be in. And then you layer on top of that the fact that we need an immense amount of metal to electrify transportation. Um, that's on top of all the other things that are going on. And uh, that puts us in a situation where we're, we're very, very bullish metals long term. Uh, I couldn't agree more, Dave. And, and, and I think, you know, if we if we look back um, last December, December, December 2020, um, I mean, inflation was running at 1.1 percent. Now we're at roughly 7 percent. Um, and I think that everybody would have expected gold to go significantly higher in this inflationary environment. So the question that that we often get asked is what happened to gold and, and is gold dead? Has gold lost its mojo? Um, and, and from my point of view, I think that people should not get too greedy, first of all. I think that gold did a tremendous job last mm. year. Um, it like a like a solid defender in your portfolio. Um, it it was a pretty pretty decent hedge against uh, the turmoil in 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 equity markets. It was a recession hedge, and I think that gold very early on kind of sniffed out that inflation is around the corner. Now, 
you know, we, sh we shouldn't forget that gold went from, from 1200 basically up to its all time high at 2070 without any major correction. So from my point of view, that's, that's my take. I think we're just taking a breather at the moment and gold is already kind of discounting that the Federal Reserve will have to make at some point a U-turn, a U-turn back to even more dovish policy to more aggressive uh, central bank action. I mean, it's it's hard to to um, um, to, to to explain or or to think how how they could get even more dovish. Um, but I think that that the last year, 2020, has clearly shown us that um, all taboos are being broken and that actually nobody really cares about those big numbers anymore because a trillion dollar used to be lots of money nowadays that's just peanuts it seems to me but what what i think dave is is most 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 interesting and that that's also kind of the segue to to your view on commodities in general our our view is and we explained that in our recent keynote called the tipping point the monetary tipping point i think we really saw um, a move from monetary dominance to fiscal dominance. So I think market participants should focus less on what central bankers are doing and focus more on what, what politicians are doing. So we expect much more aggressive fiscal policy. I think that politicians um, actually quite enjoy their position um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. basically fine-tuning the economic cycle and i think you know with the whole green transformation with uh, electrification with um, green new deals um, with infrastructure deals around the corner um, i think that's that's exactly what what, what you referred to this inelastic inelasticity of of supply that we are seeing especially uh in the base metals uh area yes yeah, this is a fascinating topic, isn't it? Think of all the different layers. You know, we're talking about politicians, we're talking about economic cycles, we're talking about consumption demands, we're talking about transformation of the power grid, on and on and on. Uh, it, it really is a fascinating time uh, to be in the mining business. Uh, but I just want to make a couple of points, and that is that you know the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. Yeah. And so we know what politicians have been doing. <laughs> and I think it's fair to say that they'll continue doing that. Um, and that bodes well for precious metals prices. With respect to how gold has reacted, gold tends to move uh, in anticipation of inflation, not necessarily when the inflation actually transpires. And we've seen that in many, many times. It tends to be a leading indicator of where inflation is going. And big picture, uh, when I was a kid prospecting for gold with my grandfather here in Colorado, uh, the price of gold was $35 an ounce. Today, it's close to $1,800 an ounce. So you know, the price of gold has done phenomenally well. I will point out that uh, major gold companies around the world are bankrolling cash every day. Yeah, well, I, I would like to, to um, get your view. I mean, over here in Europe, um, I think that that inflation is a big concern and it is that, that gold is a bit in our, let's say, in our monetary DNA in, in Austria and especially in Germany due to the hyperinflation. So inflation mm -hmm. is a big topic again. Um, and I just saw that um, uh, John Deere, which is uh, obviously quite an, quite an important company, they had a strike for five weeks mm -hmm. and it has just ended. And the outcome of the strike is an increase in retirement benefits, 10% immediate salary bumps, 5% wage increases in 2023 and 2025, and quarterly cost of living adjustments that were negotiated along with the 8,500 US dollar bonus. Well, Dave, for me, this, this sounds like a wage price spiral. So, so, so what do you see in North America when it comes to the topic of inflation at the moment? 
We see a number of things. Of course, everyone's seen on the news the backing up of shipping containers uh, at the major ports such as Los Angeles. They're not able to get the containers out because of the demand. There's concern over people not getting their Christmas presents, you know, because we just can't get things moving. There's a there's a labor shortage across the country. When we go up to the ski resorts, there's restaurants that are closed because they don't have enough people and shops that are closed for the same reason. It's not uncommon to see a sign on the door saying, sorry, we're closed on Tuesdays. We don't have anybody to work. And uh, so, you know, th this is a phenomenon. It's fascinating to see. Uh, and it has uh, been exacerbated by the policies that were put in place during the pandemic. Um, I, I, I saw, yeah, that's 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 very similar to what I experience uh, over here in Europe. and. And I saw a brilliant chart recently that that basically confirmed the thesis that people people basically they they lost interest in in getting back to work, um, and that actually um, it correlates very well with with the development uh, of equity markets. So so it seems that many people say, well, I can make much more money trading cryptocurrencies and and uh, just uh, holding Tesla, Facebook, Amazon, whatever, um, compared to, you know, doing my, 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 my job at a restaurant. Of course, at some point this is going to change, and 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 we saw that um, the market breadth is, is 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 getting weaker and weaker. So it's a really narrow rally that we're seeing in equity markets. Um, so so many many sectors are already telling us well um, there is there is something um, deteriorating below the surface. And this in combination with the Federal Reserve now having made its U-turn with Jay Powell now trying to sound a bit more hawkish, that's probably a very dangerous um, combination. Um, Dave, I, I, I would like to, to um, show a couple of charts that I prepared and that, that you hopefully uh, enjoy having a look at as well. Ronnie, when you say that, I can't help but think about the fact that that these guys like to sound hawkish, but they don't act hawkish. That's, of course, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a completely different thing. Yeah. I mean, um, um, Dave Rosenberg, uh, from my point of view, one of the the greatest economists and market strategists out there. He recently had a piece that showed um, um, uh, uh, the accuracy of the Federal Reserve, and 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 I tweeted out probably uh, a, a, a drunk and blindfolded um, monkey has got a higher hit rate than the economists at the Federal Reserve. It was really, it was really astonishing. I, I thought, okay, they're, um, they're always way behind the curve, but I, I really didn't expect them to be that bad in their, in their forecasting. Um, interesting that you bring that up. Oh, we have a mineral economist that advises EMX. And we're looking at commodity prices moving forward and thinking about how to build our portfolio from that information. And we've gone back and looked at analyst consensus pricing called analyst consensus pricing. It's been wrong more often than it's been right. If you did the opposite, you would have a higher hit rate. And um, that same mineral economist, by the way, conservatively predicts that we will consume as much copper in the forthcoming 20 years as we have consumed throughout all of history by mankind. Yeah. Um, so Dave, can you, can you see my screen? Um, I sure can. Yes. Excellent. So, so this is, this is a part of a, of a keynote that I, that I, that I just gave and it's a part about the mining space that, that I'm especially fond of and, and Warren Buffett, probably not the worst investor. He said, price is what you pay and value is what you get. And I think this this slide is particularly interesting because we all know that the mining space is probably the most hated sector these days. Nobody, nobody really cares. And it's not only cheap uh, relative to its own history, but the GDM index, for example, is, is, is particularly um, cheap compared to the S&P 500, for example. And here you can see uh, a number of, 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 of ratios, for example. I mean, the PE ratio in the GDM is, is at 13, price cash, price EBITDA, and so on. We can see that the margins are spectacular. We can see that the GDM index has a dividend yield of 2.3%. 2, 2 and we can see that most of the companies really did a great job in 
getting their balance sheet in order. So I would say the the mining space has really done its homework. I think um, this Schumpeter would, would have called it um, creative destruction that happened in the sector was very, very healthy. Yes. So at the moment, it seems we have got this for an investor, this, this great divergence between fundamentals that are phenomenal and probably um, better than, than I, I saw them in the last 15 years that I'm in the business and um, market sentiment that is very, very bearish. So, so, so what's your view um, as a CEO? Um, would you confirm that? Do you see um, interest coming in from uh, from generalists, for example, or is it primarily really the uh, the long only gold investors that you're talking to at the moment? Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and every investor show has a little bit different psychology, but let's go back and review some of these facts that you pointed out. First of all, as I said previously, the gold companies are now bankrolling cash. And these numbers that you show here illustrate that. The, the other thing that's fascinating is that uh, traditionally throughout my entire career, gold companies have traded at a premium. Uh, because of the demand for di diversification within people's portfolios, this is the first time that I can can that I can remember where gold stocks are now value stocks. Yeah, we're talking about them having high dividend yields, uh, building up cash balances, uh, the kind of stocks that would attract so somebody such as Warren Buffett, and um, that that that's that's rather fast fascinating. And there is this bifurcation, as you mentioned, where the price of metals across the board, not just gold but the price of metals across the board have performed really well. The mining companies are making money, but the equities have performed exceedingly poorly. Well, that means that, that those two things have to correct themselves. Either commodity prices will go down and we're completely wrong, or the price of the equities have to go up. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And and I think given the, the macro picture, I, I really don't see gold trading or commodities trading significantly lower because this would, um, on the other hand, imply that that real rates would have to become positive or, or less negative. And I just don't see that really happening. Um, here, we've got a great chart um, showing that, you know, the, the free cash flow of the top 50 miners by market cap, making a new, new all-time high, basically. So gold mining is more profitable than ever. And, and this is something that, that I wanted to, to show you. Dave, because we crunched the numbers uh, and and analyzed what does actually work in inflation. And actually the highest inflation beta, so the highest sensitivity to rising inflation uh, can be found at the commodity space and in gold. So so I think this 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 should bode well pretty well for, for your portfolio of 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 of, of investments and, and, and royalties. Couldn't agree more. Um, you know, the value of mineral rights is just going to go up over time. We want to control and own as many mineral rights as possible. The best way to own mineral rights is to have royalties. And just one That's final cool. chart to make <laughs> everybody even more excited about the commodity bull market. Actually, a commodity bull market that nobody is really invested in because most of the institutional players that I talk to say, well, it has gone too far too quickly already. Um, this bull market is over. So, so this seems to be the general sentiment. And we know that for many institutional players, it's, uh, it's not easy anymore also due to ESG regu uh, regulations to invest in, in, in commodities. Um, so I think this is also a great case for um, institutional players investing more into, into um, uh, commodity equities from the commodity space to so producers and royalties, uh, developers and so on, and less um, into the commodities um, themselves. But, but I think this is a fantastic chart. I love those long-term charts. It starts at 1815 and it shows the 10 year rolling uh, compound annual growth rate of commodities. Um, and it shows you that, that we have basically just bounced off a bit from this low. And if this cycle is correct again, this should really be a cycle that will last at least for 10, 15, or perhaps even 20 years. That's a fascinating chart. Mm -hmm. So Dave, um, I 
I haven't I haven't introduced you yet. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it's exciting that we jumped into the discussion right away. Um, but for our uh, viewers that that don't know you, uh, uh, I will just make a, a brief introduction. I won't read the whole bio, but just the the most important things. Um, Dave, you've got more than thirty years of industry experience uh, coming to EMS, EMX from Newmont Mining Corporation, where you worked for um, more than 18 years. Um, you worked uh, as an exploration geologist in Nevada, Southeast Asia, South America, Europe, and Central Asia. So basically all over the globe. Um, you've been um, highly successful with Newmont's exploration team, including contributions at the world-class Carlin Trent and Yanakocha. Um, you studied um, geology at Colorado State University, uh, earning an, an MS, and for 18 years now, you're working at EMX. So you did set up the company 18 years ago. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really fascinating for me as an entrepreneur as well. I did set up uh, Incrementum with my colleagues. Uh, nine years ago, and uh, yeah, I mean that's probably something that every every business owner can confirm. Uh, it's probably the most rewarding, but also the most challenging um, task or job that you can have. Uh, it gives you sleepless nights sometimes, but it's also um, yeah something that um, that we all really really enjoy. So. Dave, EMX now is uh, is trading at a market cap of more than 300 million Canadian dollars. Uh, it did perform tremendously well. Could you give me the brief elevator pitch, like the, the two minute overview about the company and what makes it so special? Yeah, well, Ronnie, thanks for all that. You, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, you know, I left Newmont Mining Corporation 18, almost 19 years ago now to found this company to pursue my passion, which is value creation through the discovery process and through the uh, management and ownership of mineral rights. And, and as I said, you, know, you can't own enough royalties. And, and we, we believe that the royalty instrument, which is a phenomenal financial instrument that exposes you to all this upside optionality and optionality is an important word when you're discussing royalties, commodity price optionality, but also discovery optionality all that comes at no cost to the royalty holder. So we believe that royalties are the right way to capture the value of mineral rights uh, going forward. So I left Newmont uh, 19 years ago to found this company and just continue to build this portfolio. It's been a lot of fun. I'll point out that our compounded annual growth rate, you're talking about compounded annual growth rates here, a very, very important way to measure um, um, the success of a business model. We first financed this company at eight, 15 cents Canadian and uh, given the prices we're at now, that's about 18 years with 17 to 18% compounded annual growth rate in our share price, albeit with some big swings um, along that pathway. Uh, I believe that we can continue that type of compounded annual growth rate into the future, if not even better. And that's our goal. That's why we're here. I mean, I think the beauty of, of this business is that it's highly anti-fragile. And, 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 and I think... Um, you know, we will write a, a special uh, special chapter about uh, the, the 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 royalty and streaming sector for our upcoming in Gold We Trust report. Um, and I think you know that the beauty of it is that that you're um, by nature also a, kind of a contrarian investor. So you basically provide capital in an environment where uh, companies really struggle raising raising capital. So. What do you see at, at, at the moment? Uh, I mean, it's been a tough year in the mining space. Do you see many, many opportunities out there? I mean, you have been tremendously busy making uh, so many deals over the last couple of, uh, of, of, of years. And I had a look at the webpage before I, I had a look at the presentation, both done very, very well. And um, therefore, I, I would love to know, do, do you see now... Um, are capital markets drying up a bit or is this flood of liquidity that we're seeing basically in, in all uh, areas of, 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 of asset markets, is it still around in the, in the mining space? 
Yeah, so two different topics here. One is the, where are we at with respect to the capital market cycle within the natural resource space? And it's cool. Uh, uh, people with good projects are able to raise money, yeah. but they're not raising money at the, at the valuations that they would like to raise that money at, which is not unusual uh, within our space. The, within EMX, we have more of a long-term view. Our view here is that we just want to continue to accumulate great assets and build this portfolio because long-term, we're very bullish metal prices. We're very, very bullish the value of mineral real estate. And so our, our view looking forward is just continue to accumulate great assets, allocate our capital astutely within whatever phase of the market that we are in. Um, and uh, uh, that's the way we've approached it from the very beginning. Dave, could you give me, as I've said, you, 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 you've been so active. What from your point of view are the most exciting deals that, that you've done over the last couple of months? Well, the people love to get excited about the big deal we did with SSR Mining Corporation, yeah. buying their portfolio of royalties, $100 million deal. 66 of that million was paid up front, half shares, half stock, uh, excuse me, half shares, half cash. And uh, we're delighted to have them as a shareholder and, and a partner of ours uh, going forward. And a key component to get that deal to happen uh, is for them to become a large shareholder in EMX. They wanted that upside. Uh, from the portfolio and their their portfolio with our portfolio melded together exceptionally well because we've been building the base of our pyramid with lots of long-term optionality now for nearly two decades and we're adding substantial cash flow at the top of the pyramid which is really going to awaken the market to what the whole pyramid pyramid contains cash flow at the top and the long-term potential at the base and so those two together i think are particularly powerful uh, we love the casserones deal that we did as well buying cash flow off a porphyry copper mine in Chile. And uh, we're, we're bullish long-term copper. We think it's great to be exposed to such a long-lived asset as that big copper mine there. But the organic side of our business, Ronnie, which is, which is us out acquiring prospective mineral rights, adding value by building geologic models and selling those mineral rights onto an industry for cash shares, annual payments, and always a production royalty at the end of the day. That side of our business is the most astute allocation of capital. It doesn't get as much investor interest. It's not as exciting as you know buying a big portfolio from SSR, but that's the side of our business mm -hmm. that is really building long-term value. And that side of our business just continues to crank. Uh, it, it operates like a Swiss watch. We just continue to acquire more prospective mineral rights, utilizing our alpha, which is economic geologic talent, adding value by building those geologic models and selling them on. And we've never seen such strong demand as we have today across the periodic table, zinc projects, copper zinc projects, copper cobalt projects, um, gold projects, you name it. You know, there's a strong demand out there. People see that uh, there's going to be a large demand for metals going forward. And we see that with respect to customer interest. Now, Dave, you're, I mean, in these crazy markets, diversification is key and, and EMX is, is not only very well diversified from a, um, a geographical point of view. And mm -hmm. um, these days, I think that, that political risks are, they are growing every, every day and, and, and probably this trend will continue. But you're also very, very broadly diversified when it comes to, to, to commodities and, and, and metals that you've um, uh, got deals on. Could you give our viewers a, a, a rough overview how um, how diversified you are? So, what what are the top uh, jurisdictions? Uh, what's the um, the percentage of um, um, uh, of several uh, uh, of the various commodities? So let's talk about the commodity diversification and talk about the political diversification mm -hmm. next. So, we talk about the commodity diversification. Our attitude from the very beginning has always been that. Uh, we love to be exposed to highly prospective mineral rights in places in the world where they can be developed. And um, uh, it's interesting, for the bulk of my career, uh, royalty companies would always advertise the percent of their portfolio that is precious metals because the dominant stock buyers and equity buyers were interested in precious metals. I'm seeing a shift now towards people saying, well, we're happy that you have some gold in the portfolio, but we're very interested in your nickel and your copper exposure because we're interested in that because of, uh, you know, everybody understands there's gonna be a huge demand increase as we move forward, uh, specifically relating to those two metals. 
So it's interesting, there's a transformation that's going on. We're not responding to that transformation. We've always believed that diversification across the metal space was the appropriate thing to do. And so we're delighted to be exposed to precious metals, base metals and battery metals uh, and have done so for many years now. We will continue down that pathway. But now let's talk about political risk and about political diversification. It's interesting. Um, everybody reads about, this, reads about this and sees it on TV, reads about it in newspapers. So my view is that political risk is fully valued, if not overvalued, in the marketplace. But technical risk, engineering and geologic risk specifically, commonly are less well understood. Yep. And that's where the inefficiency exists. And um, I'll point out that <clears throat> a place that can be very, um, a, a great place to, to sell cell phones uh, and very politically stable might not be the best place to build a mind. Those are two very different types of political risk. And so there's some interesting dynamics to take into account there. And uh, um, EMX has taken advantage of some of these inefficiencies throughout our history in the acquisition of mineral rights. We even went so far as to work in Haiti. Uh, at one point in time, we sold that whole portfolio to Newmont Mining Corporation profitably and, and kept a royalty on those assets as an outline example. But we're also the largest single mineral rights holder in all of Fennoscandia, Norway, Sweden, and Finland combined. Uh, we believe that's a fabulous place to work with very well established uh, labor laws, mining laws, environmental laws that create excellent stability. And I'll point out that the geology there is phenomenal. So it's a, it's a mixture of all these different variables. It's a fascinating topic to review. Uh, that that's that's a great point that that you're um, bringing up. I also agree that 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 political risks are probably valued very very quickly by the market, while while technical risks are are probably much more difficult to 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 gauge. Um, Dave, um, one question that 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 that's highly interesting for me is, you know, we're we're living now with with COVID. Um, <laughs> I think one year ago, everybody would have thought, well, um, if the if the vaccine is here, then then this thing will be over. Now we've got the new variant. Um, so, I mean, as, as you've got such a strong technical team and and of course, normally lots of traveling involved, how did you have to accommodate to um, this new kind of COVID regime? How, how does it affect your your um, your planning and 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 your you know um, um, boots on the ground stuff like that. Yeah, great question. And I think that, you know us today right here doing our virtual conference uh, is a fantastic example. Yeah, and we just learned to be more efficient. Uh, our travel budget got cut in half or more, and so we're saving a lot of money. And we've learned to trust the people that are uh, in the areas of the world where we're working. Uh, and utilize uh, uh, you know, video conferencing as a technique to be able to communicate with people. So it's actually pushed us towards greater efficiency throughout the business. And, um, <clears throat> but of course, you know, the geologists have to get their boots on the ground and the customers have to come out and look at the projects before they buy them with respect to our organic uh, growth of our royalty portfolio. And that has been a challenge, but we've been able to work our way through that. Uh, I believe that in, in 21, we will sell 25 projects. And then last year, 2020, right in the heart of the pandemic, we sold 20 projects, creating 20 new royalties through execution of that model. So we've shown that we can continue to sell projects, uh, but we have learned how to do it more efficiently. Great, great. Um, Dave, um, you've had a pretty, pretty large equity raise and Everybody is exciting about, you know, M&A activities picking up. We saw quite a lot of big transactions uh, recently with, uh, uh, for example, with Great Bear and, 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 and also with Pretium being taken over. Um, are you working on a, on a major new transaction now? That, that's probably the big question that the market has, but <laughs> probably a question that <laughs> you won't be able to, to, uh, to answer, but I still have to ask you. Sure. Well, we always have a lot of pans on the stovetop and we're always working on our strategic investing, working on our organic growth, working on acquisition growth, the same business model that we've executed now for two decades. We continue down that pathway. Um, uh, of course, everybody would like to buy EMX, everybody in the royalty space, nearly everybody in the royalty space would like to buy us because of the fat pyramid that we have, mm -hmm. particularly the base of our pyramid. And so we would look uh, uh, very favorable into 
some of these perhaps more overvalued competitors that we have. And this has resulted because our business model, our differentiating factor, is that the bulk of our portfolio was grown organically through the execution of royalty generation, uh, not through royalty acquisition, as opposed to my competitors that have been simply buying uh, portfolios and buying individual assets at high valuations. So that's created a situation here where you know our pyramid is fatter relative to our share price and makes us a candidate to be purchased by these other companies. So it's fair to say that you know we've been approached many times, we we'll probably will continue to be approached. And our view is that we're here for the betterment of, uh, of our shareholders on the long term. And I've been quoted as saying, I'll say it again, we don't want to sell at $4 a share, we want to sell for 24. And the fruit, the fruit on our tree are just starting to ripen. We're at the transformative point where we're going to become distinctly positive cash flow in 22 and 23 moving forward. Our cash flow, uh, our, our incipient cash flows look fantastic. So it'd be premature for us to sell at this point in time. And I believe that my long-term shareholders that control a substantial percentage of the company are of the same opinion. And I mean, you are a major shareholder of the company, so <laughs> obviously it's, it's in your best interest. Um, Dave, from your point of view, um, what, what, is, what, what excites you most uh, having a look at, at, at your portfolio of, 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 of mineral rights and, 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 and assets? From your point of view, what's, what, what's the market missing that's, that really excites you at the moment? You know, that immense embedded optionality, I keep coming back to that. And the fact that we have exposure to four and a half million acres, which is 1.8 million hectares of mineral rights globally, and with royalties across that portfolio, and everybody that's spending money, tens of millions of dollars a year in exploratory drilling, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in mine development, that is at no cost to us, that is benefiting our portfolio through our counterparty companies expending monies on those assets. And we're, we're along for the ride on those, all those upsides, discoveries being made, mines being built. Uh, and of course, I think what the market finds most exciting is the incipient cash flow coming from the top of the pyramid. What I actually am most excited about is the long-term potential emanating from the base of the pyramid. And that's a, it's a multiplication of these aspects of optionality. You know, a new deposit is discovered and the price of gold goes up 20%. Boom, you know, that looks excellent. Excellent, excellent reply. Thanks. Um, now, uh, on, a, on a slightly more personal note, um, your, you did set up the company 18, almost 19 years ago. Dave, from your point of view, what makes you mo most proud um, in, in this long, long, long career in a um, let's say very challenging industry. Um, um, I mean, you've, you've experienced uh, big booms and, and, and big busts. W what are you most proud of? And, and, and was, what was like the, the biggest lesson um, perhaps that you want to share with, with our viewers? Yeah, let's talk about the first one. Uh, what am I most proud of? And, and uh, from the very beginning as a founder of the company, I always focused on the acquisition of the right human resources. And the team that we've built here is just a fantastic group of individuals. And uh, I'm humbled uh, with the opportunity to work with uh, many of these people. And that, that's what I'm most proud of. Um, and one of the reasons why we're in no hurry to sell this company, because we have immense talent throughout the company that can build this company over time and have built it for two decades and will continue to do so in the decades moving forward. So that's what I'm most proud of is the team. They're wonderful people to work with. They like to challenge each other and challenge me uh, to continue to, to learn from our mistakes um, and capitalize on our wins, uh, which we've done for 20 years. And, and you know, we, we certainly have stubbed our toe on things. If you're you know, coming back to a skiing lesson, if you're not falling, you're not getting any better, right? And uh, so, you know, we've stubbed our toes on strategic investments, uh, but we've also had some huge wins uh, from our strategic investing portfolio. We learned very early on that when you're working with major mining companies, that you need to treat them as the customer. And uh, the customer is always right, even if you may disagree with them on certain aspects, but you need to work in a manner that's for the betterment of the project that they're working on. And so we fine-tuned how we work with them and always try to approach it from the standpoint that 
you know, the counterparty is the one spending the money. We need to help them spend it appropriately. So there've been some lessons we've learned on that early in the history of the company. Uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a fantastic run. Thank you very much. And um, I think that was a, a, a great, great lesson um, that, that I also um, that that I also have made, um, you know, developing a company, a company culture, um, bringing on new talent, uh, working with them, seeing them grow. That this is really something very, very satisfying for everybody running a company. Well, Dave, this has been a great, great pleasure. I hope we can do that again um, soon. Um, I'm, I'm really, really humbled. I really enjoyed this. And all that I can say is thank you very much for being a premium partner of the In Gold We Trust Report. Happy holidays, uh, a happy new year. Continue doing such a tremendous job. And of course, I wish you um, lots of powder and great skiing. Dave, thank you very much. Ronnie, thank you. My pleasure. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.